Chapter Ten of Men of Iron. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jonathan Feldman. Men of Iron by Howard Pyle. Chapter Ten. Perhaps there is nothing more delightful in the romance of boyhood than the finding of some secret hiding place whither a body may creep away from the bustle of the world's life to nestle in the quietness for an hour or two more especially is such delightful if it happen that by peeping from out of it one may look down upon the bustling matters of busy everyday life while one lies snugly hidden away unseen by any as though one were in some strange invisible world of one's own such a hiding-place as would have filled the heart of almost any boy with sweet delight miles and gascoigne found one summer afternoon they called it their airy and the name suited well for the roosting-place of the young hawks that rested in its windy stillness looking down upon the shifting castle life in the courts below behind the north stable a great long rambling building thick-walled and black with age lay an older part of the castle than that peopled by the better class of life a cluster of great thick walls, rudely but strongly built, now the dwelling-place of stable lads and hinds, swine and poultry. From one part of these ancient walls, and fronting an inner court of the castle, arose a tall, circular, heavy buttressed tower, considerably higher than the other buildings, and so mantled with a dense growth of aged ivy as to stand a shaft of solid green. Above its crumbling crown circled hundreds of pigeons, white and pied, clapping and clattering in noisy flight through the sunny air. Several windows, some closed with shutters, peeped here and there from out of the leaves, and near the top of the pile was a row of arched openings, as though of a balcony or an airy gallery. Miles had more than once felt an idle curiosity about this tower, and one day, as he and Gascoigne sat together, he pointed his finger and said, "'What is yon place?' "'That,' answered Gascoigne, looking over his shoulder, "'that they call Brutus Tower, "'for why they do say that Brutus he built it "'when he came hither to Britain. "'I believe not the tale mine own self. "'Nevertheless, it is marvellous ancient, "'and old Robin the Fletcher telleth me "'that there be stairways built in the wall "'and passageways, and a maze wherein a body may get lost, "'and he know not the way aright.' and never see the blessed light of day again marry said miles those be strange sayings who liveth there now no one liveth there said gascoigne saving only some of the stable villains and that half-witted gooseherd who flung stones at us yesterday when we mocked him down in the paddock he and his wife and those others dwell in the vaults beneath like rabbits in any warren no one else hath lived there since old robert's day which belike was a hundred years agone the story goeth that old Robert's brother, or stepbrother, was murdered there, and some men say by the earl himself, sin that day it hath been tight shut. Miles stared at the tower for a while in silence. It is a strange-seeming place from without, said he at last, and mayhap it may be even more strange inside. Hast thou ever been within, Francis? Nay, said Gascoigne said i not hath it been fast locked since earl robert's day by her lady said miles and i had lived here in this place so long as thou i wot i would have been within it ere this beshrew me said gascoigne but i have never thought of such a matter he turned and looked at the tall crown rising into the warm sunlight with a new interest for the thought of entering it smacked pleasantly of adventure how wouldst thou set about getting within said he presently why look said miles seest thou not yon hole in the ivy branches methinks there is a window at that place and i mistake not it is in reach of the stable leaves a body might come up by the faggot pile to the roof of the hen-house and then by the long stable to the north stable and so to that hole gascoigne looked thoughtfully at the brutus tower then suddenly inquired wouldst go there ay said miles briefly so be it lead thou the way in the venture i will follow after thee said gascoigne as miles had said 
the climbing from roof to roof was a matter easy enough to an active pair of lads like themselves but when by and by they reached the wall of the tower itself they found the hidden window much higher from the roof than they had judged from below perhaps ten or twelve feet and it was besides beyond the eaves and out of their reach miles looked up and looked down above was the bushy thickness of the ivy the branches as thick as a woman's wrist knotted and intertwined below was the stone pavement of a narrow inner court between two of the stable buildings methinks i can climb to yon place said he thou'lt break thy neck and thou triest said gascoigne hastily nay quoth miles i trust not but break or make we get not there without trying so he goeth for the adventure thou art a hare-brained knave as ever drew breath of life quoth gascoigne and will cause me to come to grief some of these fine days ne'theless and thou'll be jack fool and lead the way go and i will be tom fool and follow anon if thy neck is worth so little mine is worth no more it was indeed a perilous climb but that special providence which guards reckless lads befriended them as it has thousands of their kind before and since so by climbing from one knotted clinging stem to another they were presently seated snugly in the ivy niche in the window it was barred from within by a crumbling shutter the rusty fastening of which after some little effort upon the part of the two gave way and entering the narrow opening they found themselves in a small triangular passageway from which a steep flight of stone steps led down through a hollow in the massive wall to the room below at the bottom of the steps was a heavy oaken door which stood ajar hanging upon a single rusty hinge and from the room within a dull grey light f glimmered faintly miles pushed the door farther open it creaked and grated horribly on its rusty hinge and as in instant answer to the discordant shriek came a faint piping squeaking a rustling and a pattering of soft footsteps the ghosts cried gascoigne in a quavering whisper and for a moment miles felt the chill of goose flesh creep up and down his spine but the next moment he laughed nay said he they be rats look at yon fellow francis beast as big as mother jones kitten give me that stone he flung it at the rat and it flew clattering across the floor there was another pattering rustle of hundreds of feet and then a breathless silence the boys stood looking around them and a strange enough sight it was the room was a perfect circle of about twenty feet across and was piled high with an indistinguishable mass of lumber rude tables ruder chairs ancient chests bits and remnants of cloth and sacking and leather old helmets and pieces of armour of a bygone time broken spears and pole-axes pots and pans and kitchen furniture of all sorts and kinds a straight beam of sunlight fell through a broken shutter like a bar of gold and fell upon the floor in a long streak of dazzling light that illuminated the whole room with a yellow glow by her lady said gascoigne at last in a hushed voice here is father time's garret for sure didst ever see the like miles look at yon arbalist sure brutus himself used such an one nay said miles but look at this saddle mary here burst a rat's nest in it clouds of dust rose as they rummaged along the mouldering mass setting them coughing and sneezing now and then a great grey rat would shoot out beneath their very feet and disappear like a sudden shadow into some hole or cranny in the wall come said miles at last brushing the dust from his jacket and we tarry here longer we will have chance to see no other sights the sun is falling low an arched stairway upon the opposite side of the room from which they had entered wound upward through the wall the stone steps being lighted by narrow slits of windows cut through the massive masonry above the room they had just left was another of the same shape and size but with an oak floor sagging and rising into hollows and hills where the joist had rotted away beneath it was bare and empty and not even a rat was to be seen above was another room above that another all passages and stairways which connected the one story with the other being built in the wall which was where solid perhaps fifteen feet thick 
From the third floor, a straight flight of steps led upward to a closed door, from the other side of which shone a dazzling brightness of sunlight, and whence came a strange noise, a soft rustling, a melodious murmur. The boys put their shoulders against the door, which was fastened, and pushed with their might and main. Once, twice, suddenly the lock gave way, and out they pitched headlong into a blaze of sunlight. A deafening clapping and uproar sounded in their ears, and scores of pigeons, suddenly disturbed, rose in stormy flight. They sat up and looked around them in silent wonder. They were in a bower of leafy green. It was the top story of the tower, the roof of which had crumbled and toppled in, leaving it open to the sky, with only here and there a slanting beam or two supporting a portion of the tiled roof, affording shelter for the nests of pigeons crowded closely together. Over everything the ivy had grown into a mantling sheet, a network of shimmering green through which the sunlight fell flickering. "'This passeth wonder,' said Gascoigne, at last breaking the silence. "'Aye,' said Miles, "'I did never see the like in all my life.' "'Then, look, yonder is a room beyond. Let us see what it is, Francis.' Entering an arched doorway, the two found themselves in a beautiful little vaulted chapel, about eighteen feet long and twelve or fifteen wide. It comprised the crown of one of the large massive buttresses, and from it opened the row of arched windows, which could be seen from below the green shimmering of the ivy leaves. The boys pushed aside the trailing tendrils and looked out and down. The whole castle lay spread below them, with a busy people unconsciously intent upon matters of their daily work. They could see the gardener, with bowed back, patiently working among the flowers in the garden, the stable boys below grooming the horses, a bevy of ladies in the privy garden playing at shuttlecock with battledoors of wood, a group of gentlemen walking up and down in front of the earl's house. They could see the household servants hurrying hither and thither, two little scullions at fisticuffs, and a kitchen girl standing in the doorway, scratching her frowsy head. It was all like a puppet show of real life, each acting unconsciously a part in the play. The cool wind came in through the rustling leaves and fanned their cheeks, hot with the climb up the winding stairway. "'We will call it our airy,' said Gascoigne, "'and it will be the hawks that live here.' And that was how it got its name. The next day... Miles had the armourer make him a score of large spikes, which he and Gascoigne drove between the ivy branches and into the cement of the wall, and so made a safe passageway by which to reach the window niche in the wall. End of chapter 10